That's, that's Regina Daniels. We're gonna have her uh, moderate tonight's Q&A and the evening for us. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to Regina. Welcome, Regina. Regina says, hello, so glad to be here. I know we're all here to watch Caitlin's presentation and just a little housekeeping. So we're gonna hold all question and answer until the end. So when she's finished with her PowerPoint, people can submit their questions on chat, please. And then I will sign them to Caitlin so that it's easier for her to see. Keep your videos off if you don't mind and keep yourself muted for the evening. So now I think we're just gonna turn it to Caitlin. Caitlin says, all right, I want people to make sure that you're muted on your microphone and to make sure if you need any technical help that that's all set too and cameras are off. So maybe, yeah, can we just make sure that we have all of our cameras off? You're probably gonna have to text Cynthia. Cynthia, do you mind turning it off? <laughs> and she's like, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Cynthia says, sorry, I'm terrible at Zoom. I'll figure it all out. There you go. Caitlin says, good. I'm just trying to have fewer videos that I have to look. Oh my goodness, more people coming in on video. I'm glad to see that. <laughs> I do see that some of you have not yet muted your microphones, and I know if you're deaf, you might not even know you're not muted, but please do. The only person who shouldn't be is Patty, the interpreter. I think we'll wait just a second or so to get everybody else in and to have the videos shut off. But you know, this is always like the theater, Caitlin says, somebody's always walking in right after the house lights go down. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded. All right, Regina says that's fantastic. So yeah, just everybody cameras yeah. off. Mute yourself and cameras off. And cameras off. Yeah. 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 Can you back up to your introduction again, Gina? So again, I'm Regina. I will be facilitating this evening's performance. So we will be just asking people to make sure that your sound is muted, your videos are off. At the end of the presentation, we will have a time for question and answer. I will come back at that time. Your questions should just be put into the chat box and then I will take them from the chat box and sign them for Caitlin so she can see them clearly. So thanks for being here. And I think we're finally gonna turn it over to Caitlin. Great, Regina, do you mind taking your video off too? Okay, great, let me get myself all situated here. Zoom keeps asking me if I want to have my sound on, and I don't know how to tell it it's, I'm deaf, but <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, hi, everybody. I am Caitlin Mielke. This is my name sign. I am happy to see all the names of everybody who's here tonight, and I so appreciate you joining us. I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> so, title of tonight's performance If Life is a Stage, I Want Better Lighting story of my life. 
And I add visual description to some of this for anybody who might be here who's low vision. I am a white woman. I have brown hair just past my shoulders. I'm wearing a black shirt with a black background and red lipstick, just so anybody knows. Um, the slides will have photos too. I will be describing those as I go. On my opening slide, I have a picture of me with my two little sisters who are now taller than me. <clears throat> they weren't at that time. And we're standing in front of a theater marquee. And the show that we are about to go see is Phantom of the Opera. So it's the marquee with Phantom on it. Next slide, please. I do have a tech person, thank goodness, who's doing all the slide management for me. So I don't have to worry about trying to see that and this all at the same time. So good. A little bit of background about me. I was born deaf, but they didn't find out I was deaf blind until I was much older, but I was identified as deaf at eight months old. So of course my parents at that time, based on when I was born, decided they would use total communication with me where they would blind and speak at the same time. I think I signed my first sign at one and that was the sign was light, ironically. <laughs> I also used to get very excited about turning on and off the lights apparently. So apparently that was something that are my parents crazy or my parents really focused on, so. I went to a preschool, a day program for deaf and hard of hearing children that was in Chicago. I think some of my old teachers, my preschool teacher might even be here. And if you are, yay, <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> First through third grade, I was in a mainstream program part-time and then at the school for the deaf in the afternoon, or sorry, the other way around, school for the deaf in the morning, mainstream in the afternoon. When we were nine, my family moved to Utah and I went full mainstreaming after that, all the way through high school and college. And then I went to college in California first, California, California State University at Northbridge near CSUN. I went to Idaho for a semester and then I transferred to the University of Minnesota. Go, go first. So for all of those people who knew me from that time in college, hello to you too. I went to the University of Minnesota for both my graduate and undergraduate degrees. So I guess I'm full gopher. <clears throat> the pictures that I have on this page, the first one is a picture of me at about three years old, I think, with one of the lovely old hearing aids strapped to my chest. Oh, that was one of my FM systems, but I am raising my hand eagerly ready to talk. Thank God I am not having to wear that thing anymore. And then the picture on the bottom of this slide is the college bowl team that I was part of for the University of Minnesota. So it's all of us standing together with our little ID badges and our little gophers sign, our little um, t-shirts that we had made. So this is the NAD competition that happens every year. So that was when we were in competition in DC, it was great. I'm waiting for the interpreter to catch up, so there we go. So I think people often think, what does it mean to be low vision? What does deaf blindness look like? I'm sure everybody has some stereotype about what it might look like to be a deaf blind person. Somebody walking with a white cane, somebody who's using a guide dog maybe, person walking around with dark sunglasses on whose eyes you cannot see, or they have eyes that just look a little bit odd. I think those are some of the stereotypes that go with a person who has a vision loss. And I even held them myself growing up. I never kind of had a vision of what a deaf blind person would look like because I was just deaf. So going to the next slide. I mean, if you think of this, it's really vision loss and hearing loss are both on a spectrum. So for those of you who need a description, I basically am showing a spectrum line. On the top, you see a person, and there's a little icon of a person standing above it. 
But you see the spectrum runs from somebody who's fully blind, low vision or sighted, and there's a spectrum when deafness, as we all know, those people who are profoundly deaf, those people who are hard of hearing, and those people who are hearing. So both vision and hearing are on a spectrum. So every single deafblind person is different. There is no one stereotypical deafblind person. Really, only a small percentage of people are actually fully blind and fully deaf. I mean, really, it's a minus, minuscule number of people. I mean, most people have some sort of vision left, and that sort of vision can barely vary. I mean, there could be a per person who sees 2020 all within the center vision, but has no peripheral vision, or the other way, can see beautifully in the peripheral vision, but has a blank spot in the middle or has good vision all the way around, but it's blurry. Somebody who can see light, but not shapes, that sort of thing. For me, I could identify myself as deaf blind or deaf low vision. And sometimes I tell people, no, I'm deaf and hard of seeing. Because I feel like, you know, people say there's hard of hearing. Why isn't there hard of seeing? Which kind of implies that, that, that halfway point. It's kind of where I am. So now there's a learning opportunity for you about what hard of seeing might be. Next slide, please. Now, remember, I talked to you about the stereotypes of what a person with blindness might have. You know, you know, the dog, the white cane, everything like that. I want those to go out the window because this slide shows you a whole bunch of pictures that are all of me engaging in activities, basically from the time I was born until I was diagnosed with ushers. And there's I'm doing stuff that every kid does. One of the pictures is me on a bike, on a grass field, on a grassy field. The next picture over is me climbing a tree. There's me in on stage in a performance in Alice in Wonderland. I was the cute little caterpillar. I'm that tiny little one in the front, but that's me. Um, next pictures of me skiing with my dad and my little sister, who is now not my little sister anymore. I have a picture of me driving a go-kart. So I have driven when people say deafblind people can't drive. It's like, well, here's some proof that I did, at least at one point in my life. Another performance, this was in high school musical with an all hearing cast and me being the only deaf person in the cast. And then uh, my soccer picture from when I played soccer. And I wanted you to see these pictures because this lets you know who we are. I'm in a Facebook group with people who have Usher syndrome and there's a parent, a father who has a daughter who's only three years old who was just diagnosed with Usher's. And all the doctors say, well, your daughter won't be able to this, this, and this. She won't be able to ride a bike. She won't be able to ski. She can't drive. So all the message the parent is getting is about the things that his daughter cannot do. And the rest of us in the group said, uh, we're very quick to let him know. I'm sorry, we have done all these things. We have driven, we have ridden horses, we have danced, we do it all. So it's like, things might take a little longer. Things might have to be arranged in a certain way. That's fine. I mean, I did, was 12 when I finally learned to ride a bike. So it took me a while, but I got there. The peer pressure helps sometimes because like my sister was five and she learned things that I had, didn't know how to do. So of course, then I felt like I had to learn how to do them. So at least I could keep up with my sister. So I, at least I did learn to ride a bike one day before she got it. I had my, I had my capability. Good morning, Nancy. So somebody has their sound on. Please mute yourself if you do. I don't know who that is. Dr. Halston, the CFD is here with an elderly female with Alzheimer's. Suffered a fall while home alone. You're in treatment three. Treatment three. Will do. Lorraine Hendricks, 75-year-old female with Alzheimer's. Someone has their sound on, on please. Stairs. We're getting actually a nurse report, so you might want to turn that off wherever you are. I mean, I was using strollers. I was taking my sisters around. I think my point is don't consider deaf blindness or ushers a limitation. There are no limits. Next slide, please. 
However, in my life, I had a plan for how everything was going to go. And then bing, everything did not go as planned. The picture on this slide is my college picture. This is my freshman year, not my first day, the end of the freshman year. So I finished my first year of college, I got home and my parents sat me down and said, we need to talk. And I thought, okay, and they said, well, I have no rap sheet, I'm okay, I've not been arrested or anything, but the parents seemed very concerned and they said, we suspect that you actually might have a vision loss and we need to take you to the doctor to check. And as a deaf person, I thought, I am deaf, which means of course I can see fine. I knew I struggled a little bit seeing in the dark, but whatever. So we went to the doc, did all the testing, and sure enough, found out I had a vision loss. So they wanted to send me to a specialist to figure out, you know, what was really going on. So there you go, off to the next doctor, out of state, mind you, and was diagnosed at that time with Usher syndrome, which I knew nothing about. And what I was told is it meant I would go blind. And the doctor said, well, you know, there's no cure for ushers. There's no way to stop the progression of the vision loss. And we have no idea when it's going to go. Five months, five years, 50 years. We just don't know. So this is not the best way to deliver that kind of news. I got to tell you. Next slide, please. So for those of you who are wondering what Usher's is, it is a genetic condition. So it, and it means it's a combination of hearing and vision loss. And the vision loss is actually from retinitis pigmentosa. I think in some cases also a person's balance might be affected. Most people with ushers are diagnosed when they're in a 10 to 13 years old. Mostly that's when the vision loss starts to manifest. With a baby, I know, of course, now we can do the newborn screening, but we can test to find ushers even with a newborn. But of course, I didn't even know I had this until I was 20 years old. So that was quite a surprise. And what happens in ushers is you just sort of slowly lose things. Like for me, I remember being 10 years old and up in the mountains and looking at all the stars, you know, this huge sky full of stars. And then I think four years ago or so, I was um, on a cruise, this is pre-COVID, and I was standing on deck and I could see a star here and there, but it certainly wasn't that sky full. It was just only that North Star or the Venus, you know, the really bright things. So that's the kind of change that happens over time. There are people with ushers who don't see stars at all. Again, we're all different. Next slide, please. There are actually several types of usher syndrome, three types. And so they're categorized by the different kinds of impacts. Type one is a person who's born profoundly deaf, who has some balance issues, and maybe even as a baby who's learning, you'll, you'll notice it that they might sit up later, they might learn to walk as a delayed skill. Maybe they might not move into walking until one. I think it took me 18 to 20 months before I was actually up on my feet walking. And then the vision loss happens somewhere or begins somewhere in the teenage years. It could start earlier, but that's generally the type one system. For type two, it means a person tends to have a hearing loss, might be hard of hearing, no impact on balance. And the vision loss really does start a little bit later, young adulthood. And that's a really large group. Most people are type two if you have Usher syndrome. Type three, very rare to have type three, means a hearing loss, means some vision loss and balance issues. Maybe you have them, maybe you don't. I am type one. Okay, next slide. So consider my life. I was deaf yesterday. 
I did diagnose with ushers and now suddenly I am quote unquote deaf blind and yet I can see. So consider what that meant for me as an identity person, as an identity, deaf and hard of seeing, deaf and low vision, deaf and whatever, who am I? Where do I fit that this became a big issue? I mean, I felt immediately that the deaf community was telling me I belonged in the deaf blind community because I was blind and I couldn't see. In the deaf blind community, just the opposite. I could see too much. So caught between the two worlds. Next slide, please. So people ask what low vision might actually look like. What's the experience? Let me talk to you about that. I'll give you an idea. And again, stereotypes out the window. Next slide gives you an idea. So this slide has a picture of a performance. The show is Wicked. And that is, of course, what happened before the movie of Wizard of Oz. So it's the, the origin story of the Wicked Witch of the West and Glinda. So what you see is Glinda, the popular girl, blonde, and Alphaba, the green girl. And you can see the, you see both of them and you can see in the background, there's colors, there's people and it's green. That's a, that seems like a pretty normal picture, right? At least it looks normal to me, but wait. If I ask the person next to me, who is a sighted person, what they see, we get the next slide, this. So suddenly there's all this other stuff. So that's what I see. It's like, I'm missing things up top. I'm missing things side to side. I'm missing all those dancers. I'm missing the entire backdrop. You can actually see the stage in this picture, not something I can see. I can never see anybody's feet. And to me, it's like just this little cropped vision of what's in front of my eyes. That's my vision loss. And that's about a 10 foot view. What you can see at 10 foot, like this whole thing would take me halfway back to the back of the theater to see the whole thing. So I really have to be back from something to be able to see the whole thing, but yikes, that's not great either. So we'll do a little comparison on that next slide so you get an idea of what it is that I deal with. The picture on the left, on your left, is the full image. The picture on the right is the one with the tunnel vision that I deal with. So what I see is quite constrained compared to what most of you, I mean, there might be some deaf low vision people here or deaf blind people here, but most of you will see that whole screen. Someone asked me, does that mean the rest of your vision is black, like the cropping here? And it was like, no, it's not that it's black. It's just, it, it's just kind of smoky. And it looks normal to me to not be able to see clearly off the sides of my eyes. An activity you can do later, not write this now, is take your phone and put on the camera app, hit video, and then look at the world through that video screen just on your camera. That's about my frame. So imagine if you couldn't see anything above, below, or to either side of your camera. I mean, for me, I have to have lighting to be able to see well, but basically everything's still framed in that small frame. So give it a try sometime. Just let me know how that feels, just to kind of have it in that constraint. Okay, next slide. This is a joke, sort of, that I love. A deafline, low version person. I'm, I'm just letting people know that this is a picture of an icon of a human and a pencil, an icon of a pencil all the way in the other room, but directly in front of them. Meanwhile, to their side is a giant elephant. And it's because I could see the pencil all the way across the room and have no idea an elephant is standing right next to me. Size doesn't matter, it's location. So that location in my center field is where that kind of stuff is. And it's like, you can see a pencil, but you can't see an elephant, but hey, it's the same way. 
I mean, this has happened to me in real life. I went to the mall with some friends for lunch. And I wanted to know where the directory was because I was looking for the food court, right? So I asked my friend where the directory is and both of my friends who are sighted looked around, couldn't see where the directory was. I looked directly in front of me and there was a candy machine, a tree, and just beyond the tree, there was a kiosk and just beyond that was the directory. And I could only see the corner, but I knew that that was the directory. So they couldn't find it anywhere. And I found it even though it was behind, you know, a tree, a kiosk, the whole nine yards. So they were astonished that I could actually see that, which to me was like perfectly normal. And they said, well, what are you looking for the directory for? And I said, well, I want to find the food court because I'm hungry. And then both of them kind of looked at me and said, your food court is right next to you. And I turned to my left and sure enough, we were standing in front of the food court. I had no idea, but it was right there. So I'm all excited to get to the directory to look for the food court, but the food court was literally right to my left. So that's my elephant. It happens in real life. Next slide, please. When I look back at the impact of the ushers on some of my experiences, that's one. I am a theater nerd and I love musicals. Shakespeare, not so much. Hats off to them, but Thank you, musical theater is my, my bag. The picture on this slide shows a giant chandelier. And this is a key component of the show Phantom of the Opera, for those of you who may not have seen it. The chandelier is right above the audience and really it is huge. I don't even know how to tell you how big this thing is. It's huge and it's hanging above the audience when you come into the theater. Somewhere in the middle of act one, I'm watching the dancing on stage and the interpreters somehow at the same time, because I have two interpreters off stage right on the floor. And then I'm looking up to see the stage. Sighted people, I think, you know, so nice. You can kind of look around, but I have to change my focus to either the interpreters or the stage. And I knew that in the Phantom of the Opera, the chandelier falls at some point and I wanted to see that. So it's still kind of like, managing my vision and I missed it entirely because I was looking at the interpreters and the chandelier was gone. And I don't know if you know that basically all the lights go out when the chandelier falls. So all I knew is that suddenly the lights went out and I thought, what did I get? What happened? Or it's at the end of act one, how did I miss that? And then I realized I had missed the whole thing. And I really wanted to see that moment. So I asked the house manager, could I get tickets to see the show because I missed the chandelier? And it's kind of like this really important part. And they said, yes, they gave me tickets to come back. They gave me a script with a flashlight because we didn't have another interpreted performance scheduled. So I actually literally went in the front row. It's very hard to lip read the actors when you're in the back row. So I was in the front row with a flashlight, with a script. And on the page where the chandelier falls, I turned that page over and the words on the page I wrote, look up now. And sure enough, I looked up and there was the chandelier. So I finally got to see it, but we had to be really clever about it. Those are the kinds of shenanigans I have to go through. Now I know when interpreters are interpreting the show, they tell me when to look. So they tend to give me warning, look over here now, look up there now. For those people who have interpreted me for a while, I think a lot of people can benefit from that. If you're not really familiar with theater, it's like sometimes you just don't know when and where to look. It's great if the interpreters can help you out. Next slide, please. And it's interesting because theater access is often based on a category. There's access for deaf people when you have an interpreted performance or maybe open captioning, which often just means there's an LED screen that's set up off to the side of the stage where the captions of the show are going, which is extremely difficult for me just because I cannot look back and forth that fast. There are captioning devices like a phone or something where captionings are projected, but again, very difficult to find a good visual location for that. And then the actors think I'm recording the show, which of course is forbidden, but maybe I'm using a device. I've been given scripts Sometimes I've asked for scripts and I've not been able, not been gotten them because it's like, we don't want you to set up your own illegal production or because of whatever copyright stuff. And it's like, I like to read the scripts before I go because that helps me prepare and know what to expect. 
So these are all ways that, that person might have more access. A person with a vision loss might be able to ask for a large print program, might be able to ask for audio description. So somebody's describing to them everything that's happening on the stage. Before the performance, they might actually do a sensory tour where they touch everything on stage. They get a chance to see what the costumes are and what the props are and what they look and feel like. So great. As a deaf person, I'll go to the interpreted show, but I also want that opportunity to get the sensory tour so that those things I can't quite see, I know what's there. Because I would love to have not only the script to know what the show is about and to have an idea of what the entire set looks like and the costumes look like. And then I can focus on what I need to focus on. But it's hard for me being that person in the middle because it's like, can I have captioning and audio descriptions? Well, I can't have audio descriptions because I'm deaf. So can I have captioning as audio descriptions? I don't know. You couldn't have captioning and audio descriptions. Scripts I like because they actually have stage directions on them because they kind of tell me something. I have told stage managers and house managers that I need a script because I don't can't rely well on captions or and I can't see well then I do get scripts on occasion, on occasion. Some of it has to do with the approach. I can't demand it, but usually if I ask for it with the idea of this is what it takes for me to get access, and this is what it's gonna take for me to understand what is happening, most people are pretty generous about that. Sorry, just waiting for the interpreter to catch up. The interpreter is good, she's good. And even as a show is going on, I still struggle now with some of the lighting when those scenes where they really dim things for me. I mean, you know, deaf people, um, we're always talking right up until the moment that the house lights go out, but it takes a while for my eyes to adjust to the interpreter's light. I once told a friend, why don't you just use a flashlight to be able to help show each other's hands. And it's like, no, I know flashlights aren't allowed in the house. So sometimes I've asked for one for an accommodation. My friend has always been great about saying, if you want something, ask the house manager, you never know. And the interpreters usually tell me the same thing. So I have gone to house managers and said, can I just have a little flashlight for intermission after so I can see the deaf people signing in my section? And I promise I will turn it off as soon as the actual performance starts. and. I've gotten one because it's navigation and accessibility for me to be able to see. So I asked and I work. And by the way, you know, people, hearing people break the rules all the time anyway. Smartphones have flashlights. Everybody breaks the rules once in a while. I just try to be good. So I know I always can ask, and I also know that no house manager or anybody is going to know what I need unless I tell them. Next slide, please. Since my diagnosis, since I've been working on my sort of identity, I do have a lot of issues about what are my accessibility needs? Because today I might be fine. Tomorrow something might change and I might need more light. It feels like every day is a new journey because maybe something that worked yesterday won't work tomorrow. Same is true for all of us, I think. And yet I deal with the people telling me I don't look deaf blind. They'll say, you can see fine. I don't know why you call yourself deaf blind. They said, yesterday you could see this. Why can't you see this today? I've been told I don't need accommodations because I'm functioning so well. And I've also had people actually say to me, how can you not see that it's right in front of you? So these are the kinds of phrases that sometimes come up into my life and I cannot tell you how sort of destructive they are. I know those people who are sighted and my friends who have or are hearing and have that kind of privilege sometimes struggle when they hear somebody say one of these sort of demeaning things, they don't know what to do with it. Sometimes they tell me, sometimes I can fight for it. They don't know if I, if they should fight back. It's really a struggle, I think, for those people who are close to me. Like when they hear people say, I can see fine. 
I I often will have my friends or me ask them, well, how do you assume that? What is it that you know? What's your evidence? And maybe they can see fine because it's the middle of the day, but on a cloudy day, they're not going to see as well. I mean, I think you do some kind of education of people, but it's really tough for people who say, well, it's right in front of you. And it's great. I have no lower peripheral vision. What do you expect? So for me, I have friends who tell me things like, okay, I just put a paper down by your elbow. I just, there's a chair right behind you over there, that kind of thing. So I don't want to always be the one that has to do the education and the um, fighting and advocating. So I do appreciate those friends who do that. And I know most people are good. I just think it's only a few people out there that just have a lot to learn still. Next slide. For all of my analogies, there's still the show must go on, right? The picture that is on this slide is, I think that's me. Yeah, by myself. My sisters did not go. I guess they had grown up by then in front of the marquee for Mary Poppins. You know, the show is super califragilistic, expialidocious in it, that one. So for me, I just had to try to figure out how to navigate to make things work for myself. I just adapted. I've managed a bunch of workarounds in all of my situations. And it's a whole series of little changes to get me through life these days. So some of these are theater related, but um, next slide, let's, I'll let you look at this. There it is. These are some of the things that I've stolen from the theater that actually help me. For example, these are all things that are used in the theater, but actually they help me in, real, in the real world as well. So I don't know if you've ever seen um, on stage, if you've ever been on stage. When I used to do performance stuff, stages are almost always black. And I could never see where the edge of the stage was or the orchestra pit. And of course, the last thing you want to do is having me pop into an orchestra pit and break my legs. So one of the things that they do for actors and also very helpful for me is taping the edges of things so that I can notice in a high contrast color like white. And that lets me know that I'm at the edge of where I am. I have white tape on stairs so that people can make sure I can see the stairs as I go down. So those are examples of something creative for the theater. Spotlights, but in my case, flashlights. I have a flashlight with me all the time. And of course my phone. I sometimes have a terrible time when I go off stage. Like for me, I'm, if I'm in the place and I walk into someplace dark, I've got my flashlight ready to go so I can see when I go out there. Some people talk about um, windows. What is that? I took a dance class, but this can apply to basically karate or anything like that. When we were in practice for dance class, I was never in the front row and I couldn't see people off to my side. So I, what I did is I couldn't dance looking at the people over to my side or that kind of stuff. So what I always did and what my dance teacher helped me figure it out is they put me in the second row or in the middle of the rows. And what that meant is by being behind the line in front of me, I always had someone right in front of me that I could see. And then also if we, I had people right behind me. So if we did a turn, I had people behind me that I could have suddenly in front of me. So it's just those kind of adjustments, figuring out blocking, where's the window, who can see, who can I not see, just positioning myself for that best viewing angle. I use cues, and I don't know for those of you who don't know what a cue is, it just means that somebody's telling you that something's coming up. I use people's facial expression as my cue because if I can't figure out who's supposed to talk next, and I see somebody look to a certain direction, I follow their gaze and I know that's the next person talking. If in sign language, of course we point, it's really helpful for me if you point to the next person who's gonna talk. So I appreciate the people who do that for me because it lets me know where to look. 
I mean, we do that in scenes in theater. When I used to be on stage, I used to figure out my blocking by, okay, I know that person with the red shirt. When they exit off stage right, I follow them. And when they come in off stage left, I follow them. And that's how I know to get around on stage. These are all performance related pictures that I have here. The first one on top is from CSUN. Boy, that was a long time ago. It's a black and white photo. And it's a fight between Alexander Graham Bell, A.G. Bell, and Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. So sort of a staged event and argument. I'm very, very tiny, but there I am. The middle photo is, hey, look at that. It's from the baseball game, uh, Deaf Day at the Minnesota Twins, where I went and performed. This is a great example. Um, this is a Target Stadium, not Target like Target like the store. And of course, think about the huge stadium, tons of people, the huge field. It was really challenging for me to know where I needed to look and I was signing the national anthem. So it was extremely difficult for me to know what to do. So what I did is I put somebody in front of me as my target and then that person could tell me things like the crowd is, is yelling and then say, oh no, the music has started, go. Okay, good. So they could cue me through whatever I had to do because I just, it was a way to make me narrow my field and work within my field to be able to do my own performance. This is a staged reading for um, a theater company. And this is actually one of the blocking moments we were doing. And for those of you who don't know, blocking is the way actors move in the theater. And I always, when I walk into a theater space or any space, I'm always looking for navigational dangers. Is there a drop in the floor? Are there stairs? Is there a level change of some kind that I don't know? Because I always wanna know how to navigate safely. So you do blocking in theater, I do blocking everywhere, every place I walk into to know the safest route to get from A to B. And on stage, people wonder about how, what do I do to manage being in an audience? Again, having a script, having the lyrics, it helps me prepare about where I'm going to look when. I do that in real life too. If there's a presentation and I can get the PowerPoint ahead of time or I can get any information ahead of time, it gives me an idea of what is coming so I can focus on you because there's so much energy I have to spend just navigating a visual field. In the theater, of course, people love to sit in the front. I love to sit in the front. And that's the way I work in real life sometimes. I like to be right up front where I can see. So you get spit on sometimes when you're in the theater, but there you go. For me at home, I sit at a table. I'm usually at the head of the table. It's like being in the front row. It means I can see everybody. And it means that everybody's sitting onto the side and within my field of vision. If I end up sitting on the side of the table, can you imagine? I mean, I just get a neck crap and exhausted trying to see everybody. So I'm always at the head of the table, just like I'm always in the front row. Time in the theater is very important. You have to get there early so that uh, everybody checks in and stuff like that. I am so early, always. I always have to get there before the house lights go out because, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine navigating not being able to see. And I'm the same like that in real life. I'm there early. I like to know what the environment is, if there's anything I'm going to need to have adapted or fixed. And that's kind of related to the environmental awareness too. If I walk into a space and the lights are dim, I am going to find that light switch and turn them up. If I'm in a space where there's a whole bunch of people, I'll be looking for the place of less traffic to be able to move around. Navigation is a huge thing for me. I mean, for me to even get to the theater on a theater day, think of the planning. I don't drive. I might be going with a friend who drives and then I pay for gas. I might take the LRT or something, go with somebody. I might actually walk myself, depending on where the theater is. And there are times where I just, I'm not crazy about walking in the snow. When I was at Minnesota, you know, that snow thing, not so icky, but at least there I could walk in the skyways. 
But then I had to plan to even be there earlier so that I could walk through the skyways and get there. And I guess my point is all of this access for me takes so much planning. I can't just spontaneously do any of these things. I just have to always be thinking ahead. And so if you're listening to me talk about all these things and experiences in my life, maybe you wonder how you can be an ally, how you can be a support to a person with a vision and hearing loss. But I know this is a shared journey. I know I am not walking alone. I know people walk with me. I have my experiences, you have yours too. And sometimes it's just an opportunity for us to learn together and we might screw it up sometimes. We'll just fix it for next time, that's all. Maybe something works great. Maybe something else we try doesn't work so good. That's okay. Next slide. These are ways you can be an ally. The first picture, people walking side by side, icons of people walking side by side, holding hands. I know I always want to do things myself. I really like to be independent. And it can be frustrating though. If I've got a friend who's willing to walk with me, if it's dark, if it's crowded, if it's something like that, I, and I can take somebody's hand, that's great. But it means I have to trust them to say, okay, fine, I'm gonna go along with them. And the bonus is if you're walking side by side going to the theater, that's so nice, isn't it? The next picture shows a bulldozer, and that's a way to be an, aldo, uh, uh, an ally. Basically walk in front of me, clear my path, move the chairs, move the people. I have friends who tell me, say, okay, I am your bulldozer, I'll be your bulldozer for tonight. <laughs> now I'll be the one that clears the path because everybody ends up leaving their chairs scattered all around the place. So I appreciate when they function as a bulldozer. If there's small dogs or children that I am bound to trip over because I don't see the lower periphery, the bulldozer will often say, okay, I'm trying to get a kid out of the way here, or let's go this way because uh, we don't want to do that. They let me know everything that's going on. Screaming kid over there or a small child over here that I might trip over, something that I might have to get out of the way of. There's a tree branch coming right towards my head. So it's a shared responsibility to get us all navigating safely. And that's one of the things I appreciate are those bulldozers. And given my distance vision, I sometimes can give people a heads up on things that they don't even know about. The next picture is three people sitting around a table. This is another ally thing. If you find yourself sitting at a table with somebody who has a vision loss, see if we can move to a brighter place. Because, you know, we go to a lovely romantic restaurant and of course they have all the lights dim, which means it's impossible for me to see the people I'm having dinner with. So be an ally, ask for a light, move to a more lit space, carry a flashlight, have something available that can use. I mean, I've had flashlights go out on me, but I remember being somewhere with somebody who had a flashlight that went out and it was like, oh, look, I have one. I can help you out. Carry a spare. And also think about all of the things that might be coming my way, or if you're working with somebody with a low vision, just be always aware of that environment. Think of the fact, is, think of like those wet floor signs, which of course I always hate because they put the sign saying caution the floor is wet on the part of the floor that's wet. And I never really understood that because that means you're already slipping. Why didn't you tell me ahead of time before I got to that section? So I love when people tell me of hazards in my environment. Let me know it's a wet floor. Let me know there's a pair of stairs. Then I'm all good. I have interpreters sitting in front of me. And they know I can't see their friend coming, my friend coming in. And so an interpreter sitting there might be make sure that they let me know what's happening in the environment. Your friend just walked in the door. They're over there on the left side or... Give me everything. Give me what's happening in the environment, you know? 
Don't just tell me the words that people are saying, tell me what's happening. If you post pictures on Facebook, that's fantastic, but sometimes they're hard to see. So please add alt texts to your images that you put on social media. Tell me what it is. Who are those people? What's happening? It's a picture of blah, blah, blah in this environment. These are all ways you can be an ally. I mean, sometimes people ask me to go with them just because they don't wanna to have to drive alone in the dark or be alone. And sometimes people are really kind and invite me because they prefer to drive rather than ride on the train for an hour. I always feel guilty about asking people for rides because then again, the onus is always on me. So sometimes it's really nice if people just take the initiative, bring me along, offer the opportunity. That's a sweet thing you could do. And if you never know what to do, just ask the person. How would you like me to do X, Y, Z? What do you want to do about navigating this? So they can always tell you. So I wanted to make sure I had some time for Q&A, but this is um, some resources here that you've got. If you want to learn anything more about vision loss or Usher syndrome, these are the places that you can find out that more information. And my contact is there if you want to talk to me directly about any of the kinds of things that I've been talking. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, interpreters caught up. We are good to go. Regina, why don't you come back here and see if there's any Q&A we've got going. There she is. Okay. Ooh. Can we take the PowerPoint off? We don't need it. Great. Oh, fabulous. This is Regina. Hey, thank you so much. That's a great information, important information. We so appreciate you sharing your journey. But we wanted to open the floor now to see if there's anybody who has any questions for Caitlin about her experiences or anything. Put your questions in the chat and then I, Regina, will sign them to Caitlin so she can see them from me. So please, if you have any questions, anything you wanna ask, just do it now, put them in the chat. Okay, oh, there we go. We've got some, oh my goodness, yay, yeah. Somebody says, what does TC mean? I loved your presentation, I'm a theater nerd too. <laughs> but what is TC in your world? In my world, it means total communication, which is a particular communication strategy that was used with me. It, it basically means people are signing and talking at the same time, it was the way that my parents communicated with me. It's not the way things are now. I think now in, it's bilingual bicultural education. So you're using one language for the other, ASL or English. But at my time, it was two at the same time. Okay, next question asks, what are your three pet peeves of being blind? Oh, oh, pet peeves. Caitlin says, I have so many, what do I say? I think the mostly the one is when I'm walking with someone and somebody just suddenly says to me, look out. And it's like, look out for what? Look out for whatever it, you know, it's just like, I, I would rather somebody let me know something's coming or steer me to avoid it. But I, I get these people who just suddenly go, look out. And it's like, what are you talking about? So I prefer being told there's a tree right in front of you. Watch out for the tree branch over your head. Watch out for the curb right in front of you. But look out means nothing to me. So that's one. Chairs, people not putting their chairs. I cannot tell you how many chairs I have tripped over. I cannot tell you how many backpacks I have tripped over. If there is something you have left on the floor, I'm gonna fall over it. Regina says, note to self, okay. Here's another question. Do you have experience with tactile communication or what are your thoughts about it? There are some deafblind people who prefer to use tactile sign to communicate where it's hand over hand. I have very limited experience with that because my, this is still an early part of my journey and I'm still dependent on my site for most communication. And at the, same time, at the same time, I have some sensory issues because if someone grabs me or grabs my hand without me seeing them being there, I have to retrain myself to be okay with people touching me when I really can't see them. It's a trust issue. It's a comfort issue. I'm still working on it. 
Regina says, oh, that's really helpful to know that, you know, you have to go through that process. Do you see uh, fire alarms or anything like that? What do you do in an arena? I didn't used to, but interesting, over the years, I've become more sensitive to something that flashes, either a real thing, like an alarm that flashes, but at the same time, I also have a memory of light flashes that like a camera flash kind of stuff. And sometimes that pops into my eye because of the retinitis that I have. So sometimes a real flash can be a little bit traumatic for me because sometimes I don't know where it's all coming from. And part of that is just the retinitis pigmentosa. Another person was asking, what's the strangest question you've been asked? Because I know people ask you lots of questions, but what's the weirdest one that people ask you about being deafblind? Caitlin says, well, a lot of people say, well, deafblind, but you can drive, right? And I'm just thinking, no, you, I could drive in an emergency if nobody else was on the road. I wouldn't be driving straight, but I could do it. So I know this whole idea, sometimes people ask me just stuff that's like, could you think for a second before you ask a question? And now I can drive on, you know, I can drive a video game. That's about it. Someone says, I relate so much to where we fit in. I have so many comments and thoughts about that not fitting in kind of thing, being deaf, deaf, blind. There's somebody else who said, thank you so much for the story of your journey. Well, I appreciate everybody being here. Another person asks, well, it's nice to see you, my old friend. It's nice that I know you've got a black background and an interpreter, but what do you do with uh, an interpreter of color? Do you like them to have light colored ex shirts or what's your experience when you're dealing with a person of color um, in terms of communicating and signing and clothing? What's the best thing for you? It's a little bit of a challenge to answer that because I've had a lot of experiences and I think people have preferences. What I like might not be what some other person likes, especially in the theater. So my idea is mostly check with the person, what's your preference? I'm always looking for a contrast. So clothing contrasted with the skin. So if you're a dark skinned person who's very dark, go a little lighter. If you're somebody who's more light skinned, you can go a little darker. But for me, the lighting is almost more important than what you're wearing and a plain background it's because then it allows me that contrast. So, you know, whatever really is helpful for that. Another person says, aside from being an effective advocate, a famous theater nerd, what else would you want people to know about you? Boof, boof, there's a lot of things about me. I don't know how much time we have and I don't think we have a lot left. So theater nerd for sure. I'm also a writer and I'm working on a book. I have friends on my tail to finish it. So I'm almost done with a book. Um, I love to travel. Ironically, I love to sightsee. I love videos and video editing because I like to capture what I can see. Regina says, that's wonderful. Do you have more quests? If anybody has more questions, I know they can get to you or if you want more information, they can be in touch with you, right? But I do wanna thank you so much. I want you to be, I thank you, Caitlin, for being here to share your story, for everything that was so rich. And thank you, Regina, for managing it all for me. And I have to thank the interpreter who is still talking like a maniac, trying to keep up with me because I know I sign really fast, um, but she's awesome. And I have to thank Deaf Equity because they gave me the opportunity to share my story with you. And I hope that everybody's walked away with something new. Well, thank you. I think we're done. We'll close for the evening. Thank you, everybody who was here to watch. And we really appreciate it. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you, good night.